Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So I want to start out with a shout out to I'm a Freedom Fighter for finding this uh, section in the Bitcoin documentary on Netflix, Banking on Bitcoin, where uh, I am immortalized here. So let me play this part for you real quick. Thanks that Bitcoin was designed to provide. Jim McCaleb created Mt. Gox essentially on a lark one night because he couldn't buy Bitcoins as quickly as he wanted to. And interestingly, he did it by starting with a URL that he'd previously used to run a magic card trading site. So you get an idea about where some of these ideas are coming from and how, you know, really kind of rudimentary some of them were. Jed is so there it is, the login for Mt. Gox. You can see here, actually, um, this is obviously taken from one of the Bitcoin videos that I did, because you can see here, Brother John F. is a login, but you can also see my uh, bookmarks up here, and you can see at the top, it shows Zero Hedge, Forex, there's a Silver Discussion Group, Wall Street Bear, Rumor, Mill News. This is really old, so... But uh, interesting there shows that I had my login there when Bitcoin was 14 bucks, low of a penny. You can see that too. So this apparently was around that time when we had the crash down to a penny. If you remember, I also did a video covering that crash live. That video at one point was uh, listed in the Wikipedia entry for Bitcoin, or perhaps it was Mt. Gox, I don't remember, but there was a link to my YouTube video uh, showing the crash live. Both of these videos are still up on uh, on my Bitcoin YouTube channel, but so that's really interesting. Thanks a lot again to I'm a Freedom Fighter for catching that. So um, let's jump over to the Bitcoin market. We've got kind of a crash starting here. Interesting timing. Uh, hit a low there of 35.99, and you can see if we get out to the daily chart. Uh, so here's what we did: we ran up to about 4,500. You can see that, and almost down to 3,500. Is this going to be the big one, the big correction? Um, the big correction now, if it's a 95% correction, I'm mean in 90% correction to take us down to 500. Um, if it's a you know 80% correction down to a thousand so that's quite possible it's definitely something that Bitcoin has done in the past it's not out of the question do I think it's gonna happen mm, probably not I think the correction is probably gonna be back down to maybe around here in the base below 3000 but uh, it's definitely still you know on the table as a possibility because the last correction that we had that I was expecting that 90% you can see we hit 3000 and we really only dipped down to about 1850 so that definitely was not the big one um, there doesn't have to be a big one but it's likely that there will be another big one so that's giving me price targets of a thousand or 500 if we if we get a big one if, if that's the case I'll definitely be buying back in with some of the dollars that I took out. I'm still long cryptocurrencies, but I, I will reinvest in them if we get those type of prices. So over to the World Coin Index, and we're talking about uh, 135 billion market cap. So you know it's been knocked down pretty good. Uh, you can see that there's been some rotation here. You can see a big move in Ripple coming up here. And then a breakout in Monero. Monero is one of the ones that has more privacy on it. And, uh, you know, we've all heard the FUD about, you know, well, Bitcoin's not anonymous. And, you know, that's, of course, confusing. I've discussed before. It's confusing the fact that it's a public ledger with the fact that you don't know who's sending it. So, but there is a way, you know, ultimately that they could track it if they needed to. Uh, but then again, there are other coins now that are coming out that solve the problem. 
even though there were Bitcoin mixing services that kind of solved the problem anyway. It's not really a problem, but it's a big problem, supposed, supposed problem that the critics love to talk about. So we'll have to watch that. There seems to be some kind of rotation going on. Bitcoin Cash had a big, big rally. You can see on the Bitcoin Cash chart that uh, it took off and, and went all the way up to 900 which is close to what it did, I believe, on the first day. I don't know if it's going to be on this chart. It's not on there. But there was a spike. And, and there weren't that many exchanges online at the time. So, you know, it was a, a very questionable high. It was actually on Bittrex. You, you can see now, though, that there's a lot of arbitrage that has kicked in. And you can see... We've got, you know, the major exchanges here. We've got Bitfinex, Bittrex, uh, Poloniex, Kraken, uh, doing, you know, uh, 50 plus million in volume with a tight, fairly tight price here of uh, uh, 607, 606. So, a um, bit of rotation going on in Bitcoin. So, the story I want to talk about is kind of a, a sleeper that you probably haven't heard of. I just happened to come across it because it was mentioned by uh, um, Carl Denninger. But uh, this is an interesting story that didn't get much play. And uh, there's kind of a twist to it. it this is Matt, by Matt Taibbi. And uh, he's, he's kind of a leftist. You know, he, he's one of those kind of establishment leftist guys writes for rolling stone did some really good stuff on the financial uh crisis and the bailouts and you know definitely good stuff about how corrupt the banks are doesn't really go into how corrupt the government is now this one kind of does and that's interesting that it that it, uh shows that the government's corrupt as well but this is about Fannie and Freddie, and let's read this. This is about how basically the government just kind of stole this money. If you remember uh, back when it happened, I I covered uh, the stuff on uh, the blog, and I don't believe I was doing YouTube videos at the time, but I, I did make some comments about how um, the government basically robbed the GM bondholders because they, you know, they just took the company and handed it to the unions. So there was a lot of shenanigans that went on during the financial crisis, and that's the type of thing that they do during a crisis. You know, they're saying never let a good crisis go to waste, where they, uh, if you remember George Bush Jr. said that we had to destroy capitalism to save it or something like that. So they broke a lot of rules. But here's another example. This one story is kind of flown under the radar. Most people don't know about this. But this is the way the government just basically seized these companies. And these were private companies. They had a implied government backstop, but they were still private companies that had stocks that were trading on the stock exchange. The government seized these companies. So Fannie and Freddie, in August 2012, a few months before Barack Obama told Mitt Romney the 80s had called and wanted their foreign policy back, the U.S. government made a momentous and little-discussed decision. It unilaterally changed the terms of the bailout of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, seizing all of the company's profits. The government originally insisted on a 10% annual dividend in exchange for what ultimately became a $187 billion rescue. In 2012, the government quietly changed that 10% deal to one in which the state simply seized all profits. Government regulators euphemistically described this as fully capturing financial benefits, end quote. The press paid almost no attention to this event. New bailout terms for Fannie Freddie wrote Washington Post in a eight-page yawner, or I'm sorry, page eight yawner, Treasury's Treasury pinches Fannie and Freddie side the Philadelphia Inquirer in a 439 word on page 7. This was not, however, an inside pages news story. It was one of the most important decisions of the bailout era. Also known as the government-sponsored entities or GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were two of the biggest companies on earth and held about $5 trillion in mortgage debt. They had gone bust during the crash years for a variety of reasons. Now, this is a little sleight of hand here. They had not gone bust. That's the whole thing, is that they were solvent when the government seized them. And if you remember, something similar happened to Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns uh, 
was not bankrupt. If you remember, their stock went from 60 bucks to 30 bucks to two bucks. But their stock had not gone to zero and they were not bankrupt. And the Federal Reserve came in and basically seized the company and gave it to JP Morgan. So here's another one, uh, them doing that sort of thing. And, and we're gonna see here when I get to the theme of why they do this. Uh, but let's continue. They had gone bust during the crash years for a variety of reasons, mostly due to incompetent corrupt management. But by the summer of 2012, with the real estate market in recovery, the companies weren't a bust anymore. On the contrary, they're about to start making money again, enormous piles of it, in fact. The government has always insisted it didn't know this, not just in the summer of 2012, but numerous times since. Officials have insisted that they needed 100% of Fannie and Freddie's profits because they wanted to protect taxpayers from likely future losses and because Fannie and Freddie would otherwise be unable to pay back what they owed. Mario Ugaletti, a special advisor to the director of the Federal Housing Agency, said in 2013 of the company's debts that it was unlikely that Fannie and Freddie would be able to meet that amount consistently without drawing additional funds from the Treasury. But documents just released in a court case show that the government privately believed just the opposite before it made its historic decision to sweep the GSE revenues. One key document is a memo from Mary Miller, Assistant Treasury Secretary for Financial Markets, to then Secretary Treasurer Tim Geithner, dated December 11, 2011. Miller writes to Geithner that Freddie is expected to be net income positive by the end of 2012 and Fannie by the end of 2013. In another memo circulated through the agency's analysts concluded that the government would end up getting more through the revenue sweep than it would if the 10% dividend was still in effect. The only reason this story is hitting the headlines at all this week is because the government's 2012 decision triggered an all-out pitch battle between two investor groups. Those who bet on Fannie and Freddie's revival were wiped out by the government's 2012 decision, while those who shorted the firms have made fortunes. Documents that came out this week were released in a lawsuit brought by Fannie and Freddie shareholders who believe the government stole billions of dollars in profits from them. The ordinary American is not likely to care much about the outcome of that case unless the general principle of the government unilaterally seizing the profits of private companies strikes him as bothersome. But this story has vast implications beyond a fight for over investment returns. Lurking underneath the scandal derisively termed Fanny Gate is a monstrous struggle for future profits. The fight here is not just about the profits generated by GSEs, but what to do about them generally. Finance lobbyists have successfully forged a bipartisan consensus that the companies need to be privatized. Essentially, Wall Street wants to step into the shoes of Fannie and Freddie. In most versions of GSE reform currently winding their way through Congress, the same two big-to-fail banks that blew up the mortgage markets in 2008 would assume most of the responsibilities of Fannie and Freddie. Crucially, securitized mortgages would continue to enjoy government backing under many of these proposals. Privatized profits, socialized losses. Who doesn't love that formula? It would be the ultimate triumph for Wall Street and the ultimate shocker ending the crash area era after nearly blowing up the planet with a mortgage bubble and getting bailed out by the taxpayers banks would now be handed control of the real estate markets and granted permission to reap massive profits trading government-backed mortgages until the end of time even worse legislative concepts like corker warner and crapo johnson would not just privatize Fannie and Freddie, but eliminate the affordable housing component of their original missions. The GSEs are essentially huge piles of money that buy mortgages. They do this ostensibly in service of utility-like function to keep the real estate markets liquid. Part of their mission has always been to invest in low and middle income mortgages to give the private sector an incentive to create and lend to those who need affordable housing. That mandate is likely to disappear once the reform is finished. Access to affordable housing for millions of people is at stake, says John Taylor of the National Community Reinvestment Council. Even a lot of Democrats seem unaware of this. It should be noted that despite legends to the contrary, Fannie and Freddie's affordable housing mission did not cause the 2008 crash. And this goes into, this is, uh, I don't agree with all of this, uh, some of the liberal spin on this. Um, so do we need a Fannie and Freddie? No, we don't need a Fannie and Freddie at all in the first place because it's not, it, the government It should not be in the business of trying to create quote-unquote affordable housing. The market's perfectly capable of that. 
including housing that's older that goes down in value. It's, it's a stupid argument. It's not even worth arguing. The government shouldn't be involved in that. But the big question, the big takeaway from this, and the takeaway from not just this, but what happened with GM, what happened with Bear Stearns, and what's happened many times uh, in the financial crisis before and after is the government doing these sorts of things. And the big question is, why do they do these things? And the answer, I believe, is because they don't want things marked to market. Um, it's not so much that they're rewarding their cronies, which they are. Uh, there's no question about that. Matt is right about that. And it's not so much that, um, you know, it, they're trying to preserve the system in a sense but it, it, more importantly than that, they do not want the type of discovery, market discovery that's going to happen when these sorts of assets are sold. Uh, that's why Bear Stearns was taken over for $2, rather uh, taken over and sold to JP Morgan for $2 a share, rather than being liquidated. If you remember, I've mentioned before the CEO of Kmart Sears, Fast Eddie Lampert, and uh, the way he managed that giant scam, where if you remember, Eddie Lampert came in with bonds that he had uh, from the bankrupt Kmart he, that he purchased at a tremendous discount because the bonds were trading very, very uh, cheaply when Kmart was in uh, some financial trouble. And uh, then what Lampert did was he managed to use those bonds to gain control of the assets of Kmart. But rather than liquidating them, which is what should have happened, uh, because the shareholders, again, you see this same pattern. The shareholders get ripped off. Uh, they could have sold all of that Kmart real estate, which was prime real estate, because Kmarts were located right there on the exit ramps of all those freeways. If you remember, Kmart had absolute prime real estate. Well, what did Lampert do? He, he apparently, uh, we're not going to say bribed a judge, but uh, he, somehow he managed to get a judge to declare that that real estate really wasn't worth very much. Uh, but then later on, uh, after he had taken it all over, he borrowed against it and managed to buy a company he, with a bankrupt company. So Kmart bought Sears, uh, which that was just an outrageous scandal. But there's another example of where something wasn't marked to market. Um, in that case, it was because someone was uh, you know, committing a, a real scam. But uh, in these other cases, it's where the government, the Wall Street banks, the powers that be, don't want to have assets marked to market. They would rather uh, sweep things under the rug. They would rather uh, kick the can down the road. They would rather set up some type of system that goes on years and years and years where they can work their way through. And then we see, as Matt points out in the end, they go ahead and give it right back to the Wall Street banks uh, that ripped everybody off in the first place. So a real shocker, a story that doesn't really make the headlines. But uh, So back to Bitcoin. Will Bitcoin change all this? I don't know. Um you know, if you watch that documentary, I'm going to watch the whole thing. I've watched part of it uh, in the beginning when they're talking to uh, Roger Ver and uh, some of the other founders, uh, Eric Voorhees, uh, who were pushing Bitcoin back in the day. They're talking about how they didn't think that, you know, they weren't sure whether it could become what it's become. But uh, I think it can become a lot more than it's what it's become so far and potentially even be able to prevent uh, these types of things, uh, scams that the government's been running. Um, hopefully so, and we'll talk to you next time.